Buenos días a todos, este, bienvenidos a otro uh, webinar, el, el último de este año, uh, organizado por la Facultad de Economía y Negocios de la Universidad de Chile y por MIT uh, de Latin American uh, Office en, uh, en Chile. So, eh, vamos a dar unos minutos para que la gente se una. Hoy tenemos uh, como gran invitado a David Autor del uh, Departamento de Economía de MIT. Les quiero recordar que el seminario de hoy va a ser en inglés, en la parte de abajo de, de su Zoom, este, ustedes pueden eh, presionar el, uh, el, uh, el, uh, para tener interpretación simultánea. A todos aquellos que nos están viendo en Facebook Live, en YouTube ta, eh, Live, también hay traducción simultánea. Y muchas gracias a, a la FEN y la Universidad de Chile por, uh, por proveer todos estos, estos, estos grandes servicios. Este, unos segundos mientras permitimos que toda la gente se una. Otra vez, muchas gracias por, por estar con nosotros en este último seminario de este año. En unos minutos empezaremos. Hola a todos, este, mi nombre es Roberto Rigobón, este, bienvenidos a nuestro último seminario uh, de este año, eh, coorganizado con uh, la Universidad de Chile, la Facultad de Economía y, y Negocios, la FEN, y, y por MIT, eh, de Latin American Office. Eh, quiero darles las gracias a todos por, uh, por unirse y vamos a esperar unos minutos hasta que, como a, a las 10 y dos, diez y tres, para empezar el, el webinar y permitir que todos los que se están uniendo se puedan unir al webinar de hoy. Eh, quiero recordarles que el, el, el video eh, va a estar grabado y va a estar distribuido en la página web. Este, Jacqueline Taylor les va a poner el, el link al final del webinar donde va a aparecer. Eh, Quiero también recordarles que el webinar de hoy va a ser en inglés. Es, uh, nuestro invitado especial es David Autor uh, del Departamento de Economía de MIT, que va a hablar sobre el, la, los trabajos uh, y cómo se van a rediseñar esos trabajos en el futuro cuando tengamos este artificial, eh, inteligencia artificial. Y quiero recordarles también que hay traducción simultánea, tanto en YouTube Live como en Facebook Live, como en el, en el Zoom. Uh, vayan a la parte inferior de la pantalla y presionen donde dice eh, eh, inter, in, interpretación o interpreter y ahí pueden este, eh, escoger el lenguaje en el que van a escuchar. En unos minutos empezaremos. El link de, de, de los videos está en el chat. Lee Oldman... Uh, también lo puso ahí. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our last uh, webinar um, uh, in this uh, year. I think this is uh, Uh, it's a great way to end uh, with having a, a great, great uh, guest, uh, David Arthur from the Economics Department. In a second, Jose de Gregorio will introduce David uh, to all of you. First and foremost, thank you so much uh, for all your uh, loyalty throughout all this year. I hope that these webinars have been useful. This is the last one. And, uh, and what a way to end uh, with uh, David. Um, a couple of things. The webinar is going to be in English. There's simultaneous translation. And um, uh, for that, just click on the bottom of, the, of your screen and choose the language uh, uh, that you want to listen to. Um, the, the webinar is, uh, is also uh, a, a streamed in Facebook Live and YouTube Live. And I think that both of those uh, also have uh, translation um, also on, you know, uh, by radio. Um, 
what is the radio name, uh, Jose? I always forget. Yeah, it's Radio Cooperativa. Radio Cooperativa. So thank you so much for them also for all the support that they have given us throughout this year. Um, I want to also thank uh, Lee Olman, Jacqueline Taylor, and, 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 um, and uh, my lay for all their help uh, in, in setting up all these webinars through all this time. Thank you so much for that. And, uh, and I just uh, I want to let everybody know that we can take questions both in the Q&A and on the chat. If the questions are in Spanish, we will translate them to David, uh, but we want this to be a conversation. Without further ado, so um, Jose, uh, why don't you take over? Thanks, Roberto. It is a pleasure to introduce David Autor to this webinar. He's the professor, fourth professor of economics of MIT and one of the leading labor economists in the world. He's also affiliated at the MBR, the Abdul Latif Yamil Poverty Action Lab, JPAL, the Institute for the Study of Labor, ISA, co-director of MIT School Effectiveness and Inequality Initiative, and co-director of the MIT Task Force on the World of the Future, which releases very deep and insightful reports for broad audiences of where the jobs and, and work will be in the future. He's well known in a number of topics, but perhaps one in which he has had big influence is one on automatization and its implication for the future of work and inequality. He has worked on these issues since his master's degree and later in his PhD thesis at the end of the 90s at Harvard University that, that is called Essays on the Changing Labor Market, Computerization, Inequality, and the Development of the Contingent Workforce. His famous research also formally models and empirically analyzes how computerization substitutes for and complements human labor, as how the rapid rise of import competition from China has reshaped the US manufacturing, explores how the economic pressures of globalization have, are reshaping also US electoral politics, and conducts large scale randomized experiments to, date, to, to test whether generous financial aid grants improve the odds of college completion and long-run economic security of students from low-income families. All extremely important issues, not just in the US, but also in emerging markets and in Latin America. David has received a number of prestigious prizes, the Alfred Sloan Foundation Fellowship, the National Science Foundation Career Award, the Sherwin Rosen Prize for Outstanding Contributions in the field of labor economics, and the John Dunlop Outstanding Scholar Award in 2006 given by the Labor and Employment Relations Associations. This is to name just a few. His teaching has also earned several awards, including MIT James A. and Ruth Levitan Award for Excellence in Teaching, the Undergraduate Economic Association Teaching Award, and the Technology and Public Policy Programs Best Professor Award. I could keep talking very long about David, but I think that you are all waiting for him. So it is an honor to close this series of webinars with the participation of Professor David Otto. David, the screen is yours. Great, uh, thank you. It is an honor to be here. I appreciate all your taking time and uh, thank you for that uh, far too generous introduction. Um, and uh, let, me, uh, let me turn immediately uh, to uh, my presentation and then I welcome your questions and comments. So let me first share my screen. Okay, I'm taking it on faith that you can all see that now. Hold on, let me find you. Um, one moment, I just want to find you again. Ah, well, you're gone. Okay, um, so I, I'm gonna speak about the work of the MIT Work of the Future Task Force. And the name of our final report is Building Better Jobs in an Age of Intelligent Machines. And I should say the task force uh, was uh, commissioned by MIT President Raphael Reif in 2018, really to uh, take on two questions. Uh, first, how are emerging technologies changing the nature of human work and the skills that are required? And second, how can we design and leverage technological innovations for the benefit of everyone in society? And I say the task force is a big group of people, include uh, 20 faculty members, graduate students, advisory boards. But I, I want to mention my uh, my uh, co-leaders, uh, Elizabeth Reynolds, uh, executive director of the task force who, of the MIT Industrial Performance Center, and David Mendel, uh, who is both a professor of aeronautics and uh, engineering, and uh, also 
a, uh, a professor of history at MIT. Um, someone, by the way, is, is requesting to improve the audio. Please let me know if there's anything I can do to facilitate that. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so let me let me dive right in. So here, are just so you see, here's the the cover page of our final report. Uh, here's a, a, a article the New York Times uh, did uh, to discuss the report, and we were pleased to see it get the publicity. Although actually, I don't think the headline is exactly uh, conveys what we were after. Um, so let me um, I'm going to talk in three parts. One, I'm going to talk about the economic context of the report, which I think is is actually the most central part. Uh, second, I'm going to talk about the technological context. Uh, and how it relates to the economic context. And finally, I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, what we take away and where this goes. Um, let me start with the economic context. Um, so when many people think about the work of the future, and they're thinking about artificial intelligence, robotics, uh, all kinds of intelligent machinery that uh, you know is now becoming available, uh, the first question they have um, is, uh, will this eliminate work? Will technology uh, eliminate the jobs that we do? Um, and it seems like a reasonable question to ask. Um, uh, and the answer is not obvious. Um, so if you look at this figure, um, this shows you uh, the fraction of the U.S. adult workforce uh, working in play, sorry, the U.S. adult population working in paid employment between 1890 and 2015. And you can see over the last 125 years that this has generally risen uh, from decade to decade. A lot of that rise, of course, reflects women uh, leaving uh, unpaid, very restrictive work in uh, the home to do, um, you know, to do to enter the paid workforce where they have uh, much more opportunity and flexibility, opportunity for uh, creativity. Um, and you might say, well, why? You know, we, this has been the most uh, technologically innovative uh, century in human history, right? We have we no longer you know dig, dig, dig ditches by hand. We don't pound tools out of wrought iron. We don't use, do bookkeeping using actual books. We've been incredibly successful at displacing uh, human labor from a large set of tasks. So why um, aren't we running out of work? Well, let me give you a, a three-part answer to that question. Um, start going from the, the most mundane to I think the most profound. So um, uh, uh, starting with mundane, one reason we don't seem to run out of work is because um, automation doesn't just make us um, more uh, 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 productive. It doesn't just make us, uh, just uh, doesn't just take away tasks from human labor. It also raises our incomes. It makes us wealthier because we become more productive. And as we become more productive, um, uh, we consume more. Right? So when, as people get wealthier, they want uh, larger houses, uh, uh, better vehicles, uh, larger TVs. They want to eat out. They want to travel. They want more health care. Uh, they want better education. Uh, they went more entertainment and recreation. And so as we automate, we get more productive, we get wealthier, and then we spend more, and that creates a lot of additional employment. So that's the most basic reason. A second reason I think is, is less obvious, but even more important, which is that automation doesn't just take away work. It makes us more productive because it often just gives us better tools to do the work that we already do. So for example, you know, people who install roofing use pneumatic tail, uh, nail guns to hang shingles. Uh, doctors use batteries of tests to make diagnoses. Uh, architects render designs on their computers that would have taken you know, uh, hundreds of hours to calculate. Uh, teachers deliver lessons through telepresence. Um, even long haul truck drivers upload the route parameters to cloud-based platforms and to ensure that they never ride with an empty load. So automation doesn't just eliminate the work that we do. It actually get, often gives us tools to do our work better. That's the second reason. But the final reason, I think this is the least discussed, is there is not a finite set of work to do. Technology and automation are actually help create new types of work. So let me illustrate that. This figure shows you the distribution of jobs across 12 categories that make up all of US employment in 1940. And you can see that the largest single category was production work, that's factory work, followed by farming and mining. Everything else was comparatively small. Now let me show you that same distribution in 2018. You can see in 2018 um, that uh, farming and mining are, uh, sorry, the production in farming and mining are much smaller uh, than they used to be. And, and the larger categories now are professional and managerial work, technical work to a smaller degree, clerical and administrative work, and a lot of personal services. So there's been a huge change in the set of activities, but even more interestingly, 
this figure shows you work in 1918, and I've broken it, uh, 19, 2018, excuse me, and I've broken it into two categories, jobs that existed in 1940, in other words, occupations that already uh, exist in 1940, and occupations that have been added since between 1940 uh, and 2018. That's the purple bar. And um, what this shows is that about two thirds of all jobs that people do in 2018 didn't actually exist in 1940. Now you might say, well, what is a new job and how do you even know that? <laughs> so the way we know this actually is by working through historical census volumes, the census of the United States um, every year, ask, every decade, excuse me, ask people what they do for a living. And then people, as people record their answers, there's a people with a group of workers within the Census Bureau that need to classify those answers into these broad occupational categories of which there are several hundred. To do that, they use these kind of phone books, these thick volumes that list every possible answer and map it into a category. And when they encounter an answer they haven't heard before and enough people say it, they add that to the list of occupations that are used for coding. And that's where we see this new work being invented. So let me give you some examples. So here are some new occupations added by decade. Uh, so here in 1940, you see an uh, automatic welding machine operator. In 1950, an airplane designer. Uh, let's say in 1970, an engineer of computer applications. In 1990, a certified medical technician. 2000, an artificial intelligence specialist. Uh, in 2018, a pediatric vascular surgeon. So one thing that emphasizes is these new jobs it's not just you know, more of the same. These are all jobs that use a new form of expertise, something that we didn't need to know before, um, but because of the technological advances we've made, we need to human expertise to complements uh, that specific technology. So for example, the pediatric vascular surgeon, you know, if you go back 100 years, there were only a few types of doctors. Uh, now that you know, there, there would have been surgeons, there would have been general practitioners, et cetera. Now there are hundreds of different types of medical specialties. And the reason is because the depth of knowledge has become so profound that there's no way that just any one person could be at the frontier of all that work. It requires new human expertise. And so as we advance technology, we also create new types of work um, that, uh, that, that, uh, that uh, have expertise in those technology. However, not all new work is uh, technology related. So here are some other examples added uh, in the same decade. So 1940, uh, gambling dealers, uh, beauticians, pageant directors, mental health counselors, conference planners, uh, sommeliers, that's the people who recommend your wine with dinner, <laughs> uh, in 2018, drama therapist. I, I don't have the example up here, but in 2016, a uh, golf cart mechanic was added as a, a new occupation just in time for the Trump presidency. Uh, and so an important point this makes is that uh, uh, part of new work creation comes from new expertise. Part of it just comes from rising wealth. As we get wealthier, we demand new forms of experiences, new forms of consumption, uh, new services. And that also uh, causes people uh, to invent, to create, and that also generates jobs. So the takeaway here is that um, uh, Technological change is absolutely changing work. It's eliminating certain types of jobs. It's adding others. And so it's an ongoing challenge. People do need to continually reskill and adapt. We are not running out of work, but that doesn't mean for an individual person they won't run out of work because it's very quite possible they will have a form of expertise that eventually uh, becomes uh, automated, that becomes replaced. And so it is an ongoing challenge. It's a, it's a complex process. So. That's the good news. <laughs> so what's the problem? What do we, what, what are we even worried about if, if it's not running out of work? Well, this, I'm gonna show you a figure for the United States and this is, uh, this is US specific, but it's not uh, unlike what's happened in many countries. And it shows you the path, the trajectory of growth of productivity and compensation, meaning what workers earn, both on average and at the median, reflecting the experience of the typical worker. So you can see from, it's roughly the end of the Second World War in 1948 to roughly the mid-1970s, productivity rose quite steeply, over 2% per year, and compensation, both at the median and on average, rose in lockstep with it. So as the economy became more productive, more output per hour of work, uh, everyone's wages rose roughly proportionally. After the mid-1970s, you see this 
amazing uh, separation, what some call the great divergence. Productivity per hour continues to rise, deep, not as fast as in the first three decades, but at a rate of one and a half to 2% a year, still quite substantial. The average also rises roughly along with that. There's some divergence, and that's uh, we're talking about at a later point. But the key breakaway is the median. The typical worker benefits very little from this increase in productivity. So productivity has risen uh, about 80% uh, since 1978, and yet median compensation has risen by about 15%. And that divergence is uh, just enormously consequential. Um, another way of saying that is that there's been such a steep increase in inequality that although there's been a lot of national wealth creation, um, it's been so concentrated that, that very few people are benefiting from, from it strongly. Now, uh, if you're an expert in this matter, you might say, look, you're understating the growth of median compensation. You're not accurately adjusting for quality of living and all these new technologies and so on. And that's a valid criticism. Um, however, that would also be true for productivity. So if you made that adjustment, productivity, uh, median compensation might rise by more, but then so would productivity. And so the gap, nevertheless, would be equally profound. Now, as I said, this is a US specific figure, but this phenomenon of a rising gap between uh, the growth of productivity and the growth of median wages is seen in many advanced economies um, uh, and really throughout the developing world as well, although it's much more extreme in the US than many other countries, which is uh, not to our credit, but is a fact about the US. So what has, uh, uh, so, and, and this is a, a central thing we focus on our report and we argue that one of the reasons people are so concerned about automation and technological change and its implications for labor is not because of this top line, because it will make us more productive, but because of this bottom line, or in fact, the gap between them. If we were talking about more automation in 1973, we might say, look, when the country becomes more productive, everybody's wealth rises. But that does not appear to be the case here. And so it's legitimate to say, maybe we should be worried about this because we can have a lot of national income growth without a lot of people benefiting. So now let me just say a word on, you know, what's the, what, what went wrong? What are the causes? I think there are really three of them. One, of course, is technology itself. Digitalization of work has made highly educated workers more productive and made less educated workers easier to replace with machinery. So here's an example, again, for the United States, although this would apply to many high income countries, that shows the growth uh, uh, of uh, of employment across occupations, which looks a bit like a barbell with a lot of poundage on either end of the bar. On the one hand, we have growth of high paying technical, professional, managerial occupations. Um, those are, that's work where the tools of com computation make people more productive. On the other hand, we have a lot of growth of personal services, food service, cleaning, uh, security, uh, laborers. And these are jobs where there isn't a lot of automation uh, and they're not very strongly complemented, but these job, these tasks are because they're hard to mechanize. We just have a lot of people doing them, but they tend to be low educated and low paid because they use very generic human skill sets, even though they're very hard for machines to do. Finally, we see this large, this substantial fall in production administrative support and increasingly sales jobs. And of course, these are work, this is the type of work that is done by machines. So even though we are not running out of jobs, because computers have gotten, we've gotten so good at taking these codifiable, well-understood tasks done on factory floors, done in offices, even done in commerce, and turning them into software, that they have displaced a lot of labor and given us this barbell shape. So that's one factor. A second factor, uh, which has been uh, uh, you know, felt throughout the world, is globalization. Um, trade has been a huge positive for world welfare. I don't, probably doesn't need emphasis. Uh, China's rise, for example, has not only brought 400 million Chinese out of poverty, but created uh, prosperity throughout uh, Central and South America, uh, even created investment in Sub-Saharan Africa where it was not occurring. So this has been enormously good for the world middle class. But it has placed a lot of pressure on manufacturing jobs and manufacturing intensive communities. And that's not limited to the United States. And this just gives you a figure from the US. So this shows you, uh, on the one hand, this red line is Chinese, a uh, US import penetration in manufacturing by China. So that essentially goes from almost zero to about 6% of all US manufacturing consumption in the course of uh, 30 years. And that accelerates extremely 
quickly after China joins the World Trade Organization in 2001. Um, uh, simultaneously, um, US manufacturing employment as a share of population, of working age population, falls from 11% to about 6%, and again, falls extremely steeply after China joins the World Trade Organization. But of course, these same trade pressures have been felt uh, in Mexico, uh, they've been felt uh, throughout Europe, uh, and so generally, China has uh, had a, a huge impact. And in the US in particular, we've been we've placed very few guardrails on that process, done very little to insulate workers. So although this has raised US GDP, it has again been disequalizing. And even though it's increased people's purchasing power, it has had a larger effect on employment and earnings among less educated workers. And so contributed to this divergence. The third, and, uh, and this is uh, uh, this you know, differs across countries, but certainly in the United States, uh, our institutions have, that support labor have been weakened and undercut and allowed to uh, age into obsolescence. So uh, weaker labor unions, uh, historically low minimum wages, outdated employment regulations have all uh, prevented or it's, uh, failed to allow uh, rank and file workers to share in rising productivity. So here's one way to see this kind of interesting. Um, this uh, compares purchasing power adjusted hourly earnings of low education workers in 2015 across countries. This is from the OECD. So here's the United States at 1033 an hour. Uh, here is, um, for example, Canada, uh, just you know, uh, right to the north of us, uh, paying workers a third more per hour for the same type of work. And then if we look further to Germany, we see higher numbers. Uh, if we look left, of course, we see lower numbers. But the reason this comparison from the United States rightward is particularly relevant is these are, oh, excuse me, um, all high income countries about equally productive. And they all have the same types of jobs. Every one of these countries has McDonald workers uh, who are waiting at counters and serving burgers. And yet there are these enormous differences uh, in earnings levels. And those are institutional reasons. That's not differences in productivity. That has to do with labor market institutions. So uh, let me let me pause, let me just continue from there. I want to make one final point. Is um, uh, sorry before I turn to the next section, which is you might say, well, doesn't the U.S. get a lot out of this? Doesn't that high level of inequality lead to a lot of dynamism, uh, higher productivity, uh, etc.? And uh, the answer, as far as we can tell, is. Uh, no, not really. Um, the U.S. has not grown faster than oh, excuse me uh, than other high than than you exact than you would expect uh, given its income level. So, for example, this the x-axis of this figure shows you U.S. Uh, sorry shows you GDP per capita in 1960 uh, across countries. Uh, the y-axis shows you the growth rate of GDP per capita in the ensuing 50 years. And what you can see is that, of course, low income countries tend to grow faster uh, because they're doing a lot of catch up. They're riding the coattails of, uh, of the technologies introduced in rich countries. Rich countries tend to grow more slowly because they have to keep innovating uh, to grow. They can't just uh, catch up. And so uh, if you look at this downward sloping curve, you'd see the US is about exactly where you would expect it to be. It's not growing especially quickly. Um, that's partly because it was so wealthy initially. And then governance matters a lot, clearly. Some countries that are better governed grow faster for their given level of development, South Korea being a great example. Um, but uh, the, uh, the key factor does not appear to be uh, dy dynamism or inequality per se. So, um, so that's the economic context. Let me speak briefly about the technological context. And let me, I think I can summarize what I'm about to say in a single sentence, which is that the momentous impacts of technological change are unfolding gradually, meaning they are tremendously important, but they are happening uh, at a pace uh, that is um, manageable. So let me give you some examples. Uh, one of the most significant tough technologies that has received so much public attention is uh, autonomous vehicles. And uh, the, uh, that, as you know, there's been an enormous amount of hype and uh, as we've watched this unfold, the uh, dates at which things are predicted to actually uh, uh, offer the, um, the uh, capacities that have been claimed for them keep slipping. So here's a, a headline that I think is hilarious. In uh, 2018, the Washington Post reports 
Shaken by hype, self-driving leaders adopt a new strategy, shutting up, <laughs> uh, meaning to stop over claiming. Now, uh, here's the point I want to make. In the long run, autonomous vehicles will be a big deal. They will displace, for example, in the United States, one to two million workers from driving occupations. And that will have real regional consequences. A lot of those long haul vehicle drivers are based in the Southern United States. But because this will occur over 20 to 30 years, um, it, uh, it's a manageable change. It's different from if it occurred overnight. And you might say, well, why is it happening so slowly? We see these technologies are being introduced uh, every day some of them quite amazing. And the answer is that the new technologies themselves are often astounding, but it can take decades from the birth of invention to its commercialization, to its assimilation into business processes, standardization, and widespread adoption and impact on the workforce. So for example, when you're talking about long held trucks, these vehicles have a service life of 20 to 30 years. Firms don't just throw them away when something better comes along. They've made enormous capital investment. Similarly, we're gonna to have to make changes in roads, changes in regulations, uh, changes in all kinds of supporting technologies that make this feasible. So it will happen, uh, it will just take a while. Another good example is additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing is the idea that you can basically print out a design uh, that uh, instead of, of producing it in the conventional uh, on a factory floor, and it's a really important idea. It has the potential to transform how products are developed and realized. It can eliminate the need for making specific tools for specific objects. You can build highly complex parts that consolidate uh, multiple materials uh, and combine materials in previously impossible ways. It's a really big deal. It's going to take quite a while. So just some examples of additive manufacturing. Here's an early example. This is done at MIT printing a picture of the MIT campus. Here's a metal hip implant custom made for an individual who needs uh, that type of surgery. Here's an aircraft fuel nozzle uh, printed out for an airplane. Uh, a sink faucet, notice that there's the, the sink, the faucet itself is hollow. The water travels in these ribs up the side. Um, and here's an orthodontic retainer custom made for an individual. So these are amazing advances, but each one of these is quite expensive and it will be a very long time before most manufacturing is done this way. It will eventually be done this way and it will change skill demands and work a lot, but it will take some decades for that to occur. So in general, in our report, we talk about many technologies, autonomous vehicles, industrial robotics, intelligence supply chains, additive manufacturing, artificial intelligence. And in all cases, we come away thinking they are enormously consequential, but they're happening at a manageable pace. The largest labor market effects that we're seeing right now are from existing information technologies that are two decades old. The internet, mobile computing, e-commerce, electronic health records. Um, these, as I already stressed, these other applications are coming, but they take years to deploy, especially into safety and production critical applications where lives are at stake. Um, we can see many of these glimpses of the future today, but it will take time to fully distribute them. And that's time offers a window of opportunity for adaptation. So just, I'm gonna, uh, I just have two more slides and then I will stop. What does adaptation mean? Um, it means that we need to advance our institutions to complement our technological innovation. In the first part of the discussion, I made the argument that the reason that workers in many countries have not shared, have not seen rising prosperity in recent decades, um, is because we've had a lot of technological innovation, but our institutions have been unsuccessful in, uh, in channeling that productivity growth uh, to the well being of the majority of workers. So, what are those things? Well, one, of course, is we need to invest and innovate in skills and training. And of course, everybody says that. Uh, that doesn't make it untrue. It is true, uh, and uh, hopefully we have much be we have better and rapidly improving technology for doing that. Right. So already we're having this discussion today uh, on Zoom, uh, which is amazing because we don't all have to uh, uh, be in one place, or in, I uh, we don't have to be. In, uh, we can all be in multiple countries. But over time, education should become cheaper, more accessible, and a lot more engaging. 
when we're using augmented reality and virtual reality for training, a lot more learning will be like will be a simulation of actually doing things as opposed to just studying it on a blackboard. So that's going to be invaluable. And I'm really excited about the fact that we can do education better going forward. But that's not enough. It's not enough to just build better workers. We need to specifically focus on the quality of jobs, ensuring that productivity gains translate into better quality jobs. That means minimum wage regulations were appropriate. It means safety standards, standards of provisions of benefit like uh, maternity leave, paid medical leave. Uh, it also means having some opportunity for collective bargaining where workers actually have a voice uh, in negotiating over the terms of their work and ensuring uh, that mutually beneficial deals are made. Uh, and finally, it actually means expanding and shaping innovation. As I argued at the beginning of this talk, innovation is a complement to new job creation. There is not a trade-off between allowing technology to progress and having good jobs. They work together. And in fact, a lot of the great work comes from new innovation that creates new opportunities and new demand for skills. But we need to shape that process. Um, so to conclude, and then I uh, look forward to the discussion. Uh, the work of the future is ours to invent. There is a palpable fear of the future in many places, certainly the United States, and in the view of our task force, that comes from this divergence between innovation and labor market opportunity. Because we've had so much productivity growth with so few benefiting, people are legitimately worried that the future will bring more of the same. If we deploy new technologies into existing labor systems, we will get the same problematic results. We should reject the trade-off between economic growth and strong labor markets. They can work together. Uh, they have in the past and they can in the future. And the majority of today's jobs had yet to be invented a century ago. As I said, uh, two thirds of the jobs in 2018 didn't exist in 1940. And the job of the president is to build the work of the future, to make a set of jobs in the labor market uh, that is one that we all want to participate in and we want our children to participate in. And we have agency there. This is not uh, determined ultimately by the technology itself or simply by markets. It's a collective decision about what institutions we want to build to turn our rising prosperity and growing opportunity into uh, a society uh, that uh, shares that prosperity uh, in a way that we can all feel supportive of. Okay, let me, I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I welcome the discussion ahead. David, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, um, uh, I, I already have uh, a couple of questions that I would like to ask you right away uh, from, from this and then Jose will ask. Uh, so first, thank you so much for uh, for this discussion, very relevant. We indeed, I, I love this. Uh, the, the the future uh, is. Uh, I have an expression from a, a hedge fund manager uh, that he said that the best way to predict the future was to build it, which is very similar exactly. to. What you said. And it's it's actually you. Can, it's very very much in that spirit. Uh, I I I, um, I I like the the the, the statement that the technology um, is going to be diffused relatively slowly, so we have time to fix it. Now, it, the 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 three aspects that you highlight: education, uh, innovation, or reshaping innovation, and um, and improving labor practices, or or or, or they're also okay. slow. Yeah. So, so they're also very slow. So we, we have two very slow moving processes. So, so even though the adoption on technology might be slow, we should work very hard right now on education. So we reinvent the education that we will need to produce those skills. So, so even though both are slow, do you think that we still need to have a certain sense sense of urgency right now? Oh yeah, I didn't, absolutely. They are slow and it is urgent. It's urgent because we have an opportunity right now. Uh, if we wait longer, we won't have an opportunity. Uh, and, uh, and so, yes, we need to be continually investing uh, to produce, to keep pace in some sense. The technology, it, we will change the work we do and the de skills demanded. And if we don't invest in ourselves, and if we don't build the institutions to surround that, 
uh, then we will see more of the same. And what we've seen is not very good. Um, and let me, let me actually make one counterpoint about that as well, which is institutions can actually act quickly. So, you know, during the pandemic, you know, two examples uh, in the United States, one was the CARES Act, uh, which although it had many flaws, uh, managed to distribute money to the unemployed at very high levels, including people who were never covered by unemployment insurance systems, distribute money to households and distribute money to businesses to maintain employment. Not that efficiently, but it was actually a, a remarkably generous and comprehensive response. Uh, so that was one example. No private sector institution could have done what the government has said, hey, let's just take 10% of GDP and give it to unemployed workers, households, and governments, right? I mean, businesses, that's remarkable. Second, simultaneously, the government took a hand in shaping innovation. Operation Warp Speed helped produce a vaccine in seven months. We've never done anything like that. And this was, the government actually took a very appropriate report. They put a, a, uh, an extremely accomplished uh, scientist, Ma, uh, uh, Monsef Slawi, uh, 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 who is a Moroccan American um, and used to work at Glasgow Smith Klein, put him in front of this uh, of this uh, uh, incredible monumental task. The government then took about $12 billion. It chose three technologies that it thought were promising. For each of those technologies, it chose two companies to pursue them and made advanced commitments to fund the R&D and then purchase is successful. And so it took a portfolio approach to development. And you know, it is the, the vaccine began rolling out on Monday of this week. Uh, I already know two medical doctors who have been vaccinated. Um, so, you know, so, the guard, so in fact, we can move more quickly when we are focused on doing that. And often the reason we don't move more quickly is because we tell ourselves that we're unable to. And that's not correct. The examples prove that we can, we have a lot of agency here. We have a lot of, a lot of efficacy when we believe in it and invest in it. By the way, let me add to that. The first MIT student uh, is vaccinated today. Will be vaccinated today. Oh, <laughs> when, when did the professors get vaccinated? Yeah. <laughs> we are non-essential. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's it. I've known that for a long time. <laughs> David, I think that the, 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 the pandemic has brought a, a big change. First of all, I think that there has been a lot of push for productivity growth, as you say, Zoom, teaching online the, for us in the university, right? a, lot of, a lot of changes. But also it has the pandemic, so, so there, there's some question of, from, from the audience of what's the impact of the pandemic. But I would like to add a new, a new point, which is in the discussion of the policies. For example, because I, I, I agree with you with the institutions on the labor market, the minimum wages, we have to, 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 to revise that very well. But at the moment in which there is a huge recession, so for example, pushing President Biden for higher minimum wage in a, in a moment in which the first priority is to create jobs. How, how do you see those trade-offs and, and, and the broad consequences of the pandemic? Yeah, so I mean, the first job, the first task of course is to create, is to get out of the recession, right? Is to create stimulus uh, and help people adjust. Actually the most important priority in my opinion is actually giving money to state governments in the United States which are now totally devastated and do not have the ability to borrow. U.S. state governments have to balance their budget uh, every year. Um, the, uh, the, the minimum wage, you know, this may not be the moment to act, but it's going, ultimately the U.S. minimum wage needs to be uh, increased and indexed to the median wage. The U.S. minimum wage right now is at the same real level as it was in 1950. Uh, and that's insane because we, you know, we're twice as productive as we were in 1950. Uh, and, uh, and the evidence, the strong evidence, uh, you know, from a lot of research now is that at moderate levels, minimum wages reduce poverty, raise wages. They do not have measurable adverse uh, impacts on employment rates. So there's just a lot of room. I mean, this is, you know, the example I gave you with, you know, there are McDonald's workers in all these countries. Uh, many of those are countries of similar income levels. And yet the pay of those workers varies enormously. That's not a technological fact, right? That's an institutional fact. You were, you were talking also about the, I think that the, the one of your graphs, it, it reflects very well the labor market polarization. Yeah. And, and it has been an issue that for you has been quite important. And on this issue that low skill and high skill jobs remain strong, but there are middle, there are many middle in the middle, perhaps those that are 
routine jobs that require skills but are programmable and, and then replaced by machines. Yes. Now, now one solution and, and, and one solution is we say education. This could, a hundred years ago, you could say education is to provide education. Today we have a more dif difficult challenge because it's to, to change education. And, and, and it's much more difficult to change the process of, of education than just putting people to, to at, at, at school. And how do you see the trend of labor market polarization and the role for the state? Yeah, so you know, polarization, as you said, has a lot to do with you know, kind of codification of routine tasks and uh, being able to automate them. There are middle skill jobs that are also important and growing and will be with us that don't follow that description, right? So there's many jobs in health services that combine technical skills with interpersonal skills and that many of them do not require a four-year college degree. Um, and uh, those jobs uh, are growing, you know, in most countries, uh, especially because populations are aging. A second is there are many skilled jobs that require, for example, there will be jobs in construction, in uh, electrical work, in plumbing, uh, lots of trade work that will continue to grow. Um, so I don't want to say there's no future for middle skill jobs, but a lot of the traditional middle skill jobs have declined. So a lot of the office work, a lot of the production work, I don't think that will be coming back. However, it's still the case that even in those jobs, there's replacement hiring. Many of the people doing that work are older and they retire. And so even as an occupation shrinks, it still hires people. <laughs> um, but in terms of skilling, I agree with you, it's a challenge. Um, and, you know, in many places, the challenge is not the four-year college degree. It's the, the people between, you know, secondary education and some other skilled work. And that's where, and that's often adults as well as young people. And that's where we really need investment, I think, much more. So, of course, K through 12 education, extremely important. Of course, universities, but everyone agrees on that. That's not an issue. Um, what is important is the, a lot of the skilled work that is in between those things. And there, I think a combination of technology and investment can help us. I do think the ability to train people using new tools uh, will improve dramatically. I really think that we are, you know, at the, we are at the very beginning of an education revolution. And what makes it, again, what makes it so special, what's so different is one, it will be relatively inexpensive. Education is incredibly expensive. It's so labor intensive, has very low productivity growth. Uh, two, it will be accessible. You won't have to go to a special place to do it, right? You will be able to access it from wherever your computer is. And third is it will be more interactive, right? When we use these tools better, and especially when we're talking about educating adults, adults do not do well sitting in classroom for long hours watching people lecture. They have kids on their mind. They have things to worry about, right? They just don't have that kind of time and attention span. Engaging learning through new tools is going to do better. It's gonna take a while to get there, it's not a miracle at this point, but I think it, it will be. So uh, uh, it, is, it is a challenge, but at least we have uh, not just a real challenge, but also the possibility of doing it differently and better than we have done historically. A question that, that, that I see repeatedly, um, in, uh, um, but by the way, we're gonna send you your, the many questions that you have <laughs> later. Sure. I think we will be able to yeah. answer them. Okay. Yeah. You don't need to answer them this yeah. afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, but there, there, there is one question that I find uh, particularly interesting, which is about how, uh, how COVID has changed the trend of some of the technologies that see it, that some might have been accelerated, but some have may, might have been um, uh, slowed down. So uh, from, from the list that, that, that the task force analyzed, do you have a sense of which ones probably are going to be accelerated due to COVID and which ones might be a little bit delayed? Sure. So I actually think the most significant technological change as a result of COVID is also the one that's most obvious, uh, which is telepresence. The fact that we do are doing all these things online. Now you can say, look, Zoom existed prior to COVID. And that's true. I've been using it for years with co-authors. Um, but what the difference is that we have changed, we've solved a collection of collective action problem because we've all moved the norm simultaneously. So, you know, you can imagine hundred years ago, I could say, look, I don't want to buy a telephone until you buy a telephone and you don't want to buy a telephone until I buy a telephone. There's no point in me just owning it, right? Similarly, we've all agreed now that doing things telepresently uh, is a valid alternative to doing them in person. 
And so that's going to have huge effects, not just for the way we do our work, but for other people's work, right? So, you know, international business travel, a lot of business travel probably declined by, by at least a third, right? And because I'm no longer going to cross the continents for a 90 minute meeting, unless someone pays me a lot of money. Um, uh, you know, it's just, it's just insane to do that. And businesses aren't going to pay for the workers to do that. So people traveling to premier cities, right, you know, to New York, to London, to Buenos Aires, right, to Mexico City, right, for meetings on, that's going to decline. And that doesn't just affect airlines, right, although business passengers are the ones who, where all the profits come from, but affects drivers of limos and taxis and Ubers, hotels, expensive hotels that have, you know, f that are full on weeknights with business travelers, people eating out at expensive restaurants on expensive accounts, basically all the life support systems that support people when they're away from their home and spending other people's money, right? That's going to decline. Similarly, people are going to commute less. And so all these things are going to reduce demand for a lot of these in-person support services, the food service, the cleaning, the building security, the personal transportation, um, even the entertainment and recreation. So that's going to be a major adjustment. Now, there are benefits that can come from that, right? I mean, all these people crowding into expensive cities, right? It creates congestion. It's costly. In fact, in, in many high-income countries, low-income people are just being priced out of these cities. They can't even afford to, to live in them, even though they want to work there. Um, and if we can spread out, you know, instead of having these kind of superstar concentrations of wealth, uh, that actually could have even social benefits, right? In the U.S., you know, we're incredibly geographically divided. Uh, you know, all the, you know, all the voters for Joe Biden are, you know, <laughs> in a, a few highly concentrated places, for example. It would be great if people spread out and mixed a bit more, but it's still going to be a large adjustment. And as with many things, the benefits accrue immediately to highly educated workers who are doing kind of remote or knowledge work who already have adapted right? The recession is over in the United States for people with college degree. But if you're a person working in services, the recession is still extremely deep and it's not clear. And when we come back, we will not be the same. And so that's the most profound change, I think, as a consequence of, foot of COVID. I could go on with other examples. I'm happy to do so, but let me, let me pause here. There's a lot of questions about the institutions, in particular labor institutions. And we know that Europe is very different from the United States in that regard. So I have, we, I'm just grouping many of the questions. Uh, yeah. So for example, the bell shape that you highlighted on the, on, on the labor, so how different does that look? I mean, we know income inequality is, uh, has increased by less in Europe, even though I think it has increased. But anyway, we, we would like to hear your views, a, a fast comparison uh, about the economic consequences in the last 30 years in between Europe and United States. And you yeah, can, so yeah. it's a great question. It, all right, so here it's, there's a subtlety here, which is the occupational changes look quite similar. Uh, in most, high, most of Europe, you see a decline in production work, in office work, a rise, of course, in professional, technical, and managerial, and then at least a, a growth in these services. Um, the difference is the translation between that and wage and earnings inequality. And there it's much less dramatic, which is to their benefit. It's they've all, and you know, all these countries have faced the same digitalization pressures, the same globalization pressures. They all have aging labor forces, right? They're all watching China rise, but how they have translated, and they've all had modest productivity growth like the US, not startling, right? Relative to second world, you know, the first, you know, mid century, but still solid. But the translation from that into, uh, into uh, median wages and typical outcomes is quite different. And they have not, and you might say, well, but they must be paying a high price. Not clear that's true, right? Employment to population rates uh, are higher in Scandinavia, are higher in Germany than they are in the United States. There, you know, there are many examples. So and this is where I like to say, there is not an obvious trade-off between strong labor markets and other forms of innovation and, uh, and productive and, and economic activity. So I think they show, what they show us is there's a range of choices that are available to us. You can think of, you know, all this productivity growth as a resource and how we want to spend it. We have a lot of discretion on how we spend that resource. Yeah, it's, uh... they say that the added, added couple of questions that are there also, and, and, and it has to do with the tensions um, with the tensions of this transformation on the on the world economy, 
is where you can, you, you can see two, two things. One is uh, the increase in social unrest. And the other thing uh, uh, is regarding a universal basic income that, that has been also always proposed as a, as a way to, to mitigate in a way the, 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 the problems of a, a, a job dis distraction. Yeah, so the social unrest, I mean, you know, there are many causes of social unrest. Um, I do think in the US there's evidence that uh, the, in particular, the China trade shock was actually quite consequential. Um, so I, I think that the, there is a sense that, you know, some of that social unrest comes from the sense that the system is not working uh, to, you know, kind of its collective benefit. And that makes people feel, uh, you know, furious, understandably, and correctly so. And, you know, the, one of the things that does is most effective in quelling social unrest is strong economic growth, <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, people are just not as unhappy when they see their, you know, incomes rising. You could, you know, China understands this better than any country, right? The deal in China is, you know, don't complain about personal freedoms and we will deliver 7% growth per year, you know, year after year. Many people are like, well, I'll take that bargain. Uh, and, uh, and so I do think, uh, so, you know, the U.S. has been particularly buffeted, but many countries have. And I, I do think this feeds into that. So uh, I think if we do better, like when I, when you say, when people ask me, well, how should the Biden administration, for example, respond to all the craziness and the QAnon people and the conspiracy theorists, and my view is the best way to respond is just be competent and accomplish things that people value. And then they'll focus on that. Um, in terms of universal basic income, um, uh, universal basic income in the developing, in the, in the developed world and in middle income countries seems to me the answer to a problem that we don't have. Um, and, and the problem that it would be an answer to is one where there just isn't enough in jobs. And so we need to uh, get people an alternative source of income when there isn't employment. And I don't see us in, again, in middle income and high income countries going in that direction at the moment. There is a lot of employment. I would rather um, see the same, and universal basic income, of course, is an extremely expensive thing to do. It's you know, an enormous amount of money. So if I were gonna do that, I would rather use that same level of societal resources to improve the quality of jobs, right? Through minimum wages, through uh, labor standards, through universal provision of healthcare, uh, and to invest in skills and institutions and even in public infrastructure. So uh, it's not that I don't want to see that type of investment. It's just that I would rather use it to support work rather than support leisure. Now, there may come a time when, you know, there just isn't work, you know, I don't see it, but I don't want to say it couldn't happen. At that point, we would have a lot of productivity without a lot of work, then we would need universal basic income. I also think in the, in the, in the underdeveloped parts of the world, in, in poor countries, another reason for universal basic income is people have faced real liquidity crises, they can't borrow, they don't have the resources to make productive investments. Uh, and there, I think universal basic income can do a lot of good. But in more developed parts of the world, I think it's not the answer, it's an answer to a problem we don't have. And in many cases, it doesn't solve the problems that people think it solves. Like even if you give someone a generous UBI, that actually doesn't cover their insurance needs. Your health needs are can easily swamp five years, 10 years of UBI in the course of a month. Uh, it doesn't cover disability. It, it doesn't cover, it, it generally will not be enough to substitute for work. So uh, it, it, uh, I can see the attraction, um, but I'm not a strong supporter relative to other alternative uses of that level of societal resources. In other words, you're solving the symptom, not the problem. That's what you're saying. So, so I'm not even sure there's a symptom. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, the symptom, no, the symptom is that, you know, my income has not increased uh, okay, as yeah. fast as, as the rest of the economy. So share some of that with me. So, okay. Yeah. So I would, okay. Yes, I am in favor. I do want to address that symptom, uh, yeah. but I want to address it differently. Differently. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I want to invest it through skills and job quality and other institutions. Yeah, because my feeling is that, you know, both the political system and the society are trying to find a response to, mm -hmm. to, to what you highlighted, this great uh, divergence. I don't know, that, that's yeah. in your sign, the yeah. great divergence. Um, but so, you know, we're seeking for the bad, 
bad ones. I mean, what, what you know, so it, it has to be either the banks or has to be the big techs now. That's that's the new one. Uh, so, and again, I understand if you have an unregulated uh, monopoly, uh, you know, we are exactly reproducing that fact. But so it would be better to regulate it, not necessarily to dismantle. I mean, maybe dismantling is the, the regulatory response, but but in every country they are actually in 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 this search for the guilty, no? So, and and and, and you see, the, 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 what you just highlighted is a statement that in Latin America I feel is is very strong. It's a, it, we always feel that we are rich, we are entitled to a better standard of living, but somebody took it. Yeah. So we're trying to find the somebody. You see. So then it's either the foreigners, it's either you know the big techs. It's, it's, so. So every country in Latin America is, is looking for the somebody as opposed to start by saying, well, we are not that rich. We could be richer if we work harder. I mean, like change the narrative. But, but, it's, you know, but I do think there's, these distributional issues are real. I think they're yeah. highly consequential and there is a lot of wealth in it. Um, but I, the question is, how do you get it? Uh, you know, how do you distribute it effectively? And I do not simply think that taxing and transferring is an effective way to do that. It has to be... Uh, you have to, you have to, that's why I'm saying, focusing on the quality of jobs per se. So what someone would call pre-distribution rather than redistribution, right? I would like, and, and I think that's going to be in the long run, more politically viable, right? Uh, so, 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 so stronger labor unions. Exactly, stronger labor market institutions combined with good skills training, yeah. right? Uh, so I, I don't think skills training on its own is sufficient. It's necessary, it's not sufficient. Um, but then, yeah, stronger labor unions, better regulation, right? Things that ensure that some of that uh, rising productivity goes to, uh, you know, many more people. And again, I don't think, I, I think, and if you ask people, would you be happier with that system or one where, you know, you have crappy jobs, but you receive a check from the government every month uh, to compensate you for your crappy job? Uh, I think many people would say, no, I'd rather have a better job, right? I'd rather have the dignity of good work where I'm treated well where I have some economic security and I'm compensated reasonably for my own efforts, right? And I think that politic, you know, that has much better, you know, long-term social viability than one which says, you know, we just tax, you know, Jeff Bezos and you know, Mark Zuckerberg, for example, and just send checks to everybody else. In the long run, that's not, that's just not going to be sustainable. That's not sustainable. Yeah. The, the, yeah. It, dignity. And, it, yeah, well, I mean, look, work is valuable. Yeah. Work isn't just a way of creating income so you can consume in your spare time, right? Yeah. Work gives you purpose. It gives you identity. It gives you social standing. It gives you a circle of friends. It gives you a structure for your time and, you know, and a sense that you're doing something useful. Work, work has many benefits. I do not want to see the end of work and not just, that is an income distribution problem, but even more importantly, it's, it, you know, what will people do if they're not working? They'll be on Facebook and then we're all doomed. Yeah, they, well, except the ones that are watching this talk on Facebook Live. <laughs> it's a small to, subset. It's a small set, but I want to exclude those. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, it, 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 very interesting. Uh, you remind me of a sentence that uh, Jeffrey Sachs said many, many years ago that said that, uh, uh, that, that these technologies produce a lot of uh, wealth. We have to make sure that they also produce welfare. Yes. Exactly. That's a, that's a, it's a beautiful sentence. Uh, so yeah. I said it many, many years ago. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, I want to be cognizant of the time. So uh, let's take, uh, can, can you, uh, Jose, you have a, a last question. I want to give you a chance. No, I'm saying, I, I think that, I, I think that they said, it, it has been in mind with your work for, with the Gordon Hanson, David Dorn on globalization. Which yeah. is another very important issue and has been has a lot of implications, especially for jobs and income inequality in the US. And, and as you as you show, globalization and trade, and even in the US and for China and for all the world, has been welfare enhancing and people can live better. But it has very local, intense effects that yeah. could be quite negative. And so the perception that people has about this welfare improving things like, let's say, it's a equivalent to $10 a day for all the humanity. But in a, in a small town, it may be a lot of 
of, of the end of factories and, and jobs. Yeah. So how how you square that in terms of uh, uh, policies and, and, and intervention and, 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 and allowing for transformation, yeah. but minimizing cost? Yeah, so I, mean, I think there are you know, two answers I have to that. You know, if we want to, be, there's lots of benefits to globalization. Um, if we want to realize, and we should recognize they are is beneficial, but if we're going to realize those benefits, we need to pay some of the adjustment costs. And why should why should most of us benefit? Only a few of us pay those pay those costs, right? So we should be where we see where we and we can forecast where these trade adjustments will be painful. We should be stepping in and not again not just sending checks, investing in skills, helping rebuild industry. That's hard to do, obviously. The other thing I would say is that. The rate of change matters a lot, just like with autonomous vehicles, right? I think the U.S. went too fast with globalization in the 2000s without any guardrails uh, and did not put in place policies that would have mitigated the really wrenching consequences. And that was a mistake. Uh, if you're going to, you know, it was, it was kind of a form of shock therapy <laughs> uh, and we didn't handle it well. We did not handle the shock well at all. Uh, and you could have achieved the same end over a slightly longer period of time, and it would have been somewhat easier. You know, and there are many precedents for this. For example, the elimination of the multi-fiber agreement, which was so consequential for so many countries, took place over 20 years in three different stages. Right? That was a huge reduction in trade barriers it had to happen, but it didn't, it didn't happen overnight. And that gradualism is beneficial when you're talking about something that is, that is this disruptive. So. You know, it's not, it's never going to be easy and it's not really possible to fully compensate people for the loss of livelihood. It isn't just for the reason that we're talking about, about jobs being a part of identity, but there are different degrees of harm and so just opening the spigot and saying, well, sink or swim, uh, that's not really a wise policy. Yes. Great. Well, nice. Uh, it's a so, great call for gradualism and, and taking care of the, of the cost of the, yeah, yeah, I, I, really gradualism, yeah I, 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 I want to say it's gradualism of policy, but urgency on starting now. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. So, no, the, investment, the challenge is immediately in front of us. In fact, the last four decades already show us we can blow this, right? Yeah. We can have a lot of productivity growth without a lot of shared prosperity. Uh, so we don't need, it's not just speculative. It's not just like this could happen. This has happened. Yes. Right? The question is whether we can not repeat the same errors, whether we can do better. And that, you know, it's the, it's not, you know, it's not, the, the time's not coming. It's already well underway. Um, what a fantastic way to finish uh, our year of talks, uh, David. Thank you so much uh, for thank this talk. And, and thank you, everybody, uh, uh, Jacqueline, Lee, and, and May for, for all the hard work that you did this year. Well, we started uh, these uh, webinars uh, as, um, as thinking what was happening uh, in the next five minutes with COVID. <laughs> we were totally desperate about the fiscal situation in Latin America. And, and we ended the, and we started with Carmen Reinhardt and we ended the year with uh, David thinking about what is the homework that we have to do the next uh, uh, you know, 20 years uh, in our region. Uh, something that is, uh, incredibly interesting is that from the very beginning to, to this one at the end, uh, it has always been the fact that uh, we need to work today to build uh, that future that will be better for, for all our citizens, for us and for the rest of the world. So the message from David today uh, is no different from the other 20 talks we have had this year. So thank you so much, David. Uh, yeah, it's different in the content. <laughs> I think that I have been advocating for the last uh, uh, five months uh, urgency, urgency. <laughs> so on, in, on on distribution, on education, and so on. So I'm I'm really glad that that you gave that uh, to all of us today. Uh, thank, thank you, you David. Much. We will come thank back um, next year. Jose, this has been a great pleasure. Uh, uh, keep posted. We will let you know. Uh, the new uh, set of uh, webinars when they're going to be and, um, and and thank you so much uh, for for all the time and all the uh, loyalty that all of you have shown uh, throughout all this uh, uh, month. Please uh, have a great Christmas, Happy New Year uh, for all of you. Uh, stay safe, please. Uh, I know that the vaccine is here, but it, it, what needs here is that you know we know three people that have got uh, the vaccine, so it will be a while. There. 
is it's there, it? not still in Latin America. So we have a long time. To exactly, we have a long time. So please still stay safe and 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 and, and, and protect your loved ones and uh, and and your communities. Thank you so much, uh, to everybody. Thank you so much, David, uh, for finishing. Uh, it's an honor. Thank, thank you. Thank you for all of you for your questions. It's a great way, way to finish. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. We couldn't finish in a better way. <laughs> thank you so much, David. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.